uh, one of the reasons why we decided to live stream this event was because of the immense interest um, that we received, an interest that far exceeded the, the number of seats and availability that we had in this room. And this interest speaks to why we actually or organized this event in the first place. And um, for those of you who might not be familiar with UCLIET, it is um, the Education and Development Forum that provides a community for universities, NGOs, consultancy groups to share ideas, knowledge, and expertise. And this is mostly done through the UCLIET conference that happens in Oxford every two years. Um, and it was actually at the conference last year that I was having a conversation with a different advisor, Ros Gator, who unfortunately couldn't be here today. Um, but we were talking about how, although there were several presentations at the conference on education emergencies, um, wouldn't it be great to bring together all of the knowledge and expertise um, into one focused <clears throat> event? And so given that this is a non-conference year for UCVIET, um, that's exactly what we've done. So the aim of today is to bring together all the researchers, practitioners, donors who are working in this field and to, bring, uh, to build the partnerships and discourse on education and emergencies, particularly in the UK. Um, as many of you already know, there's a well-established um, network on education emergencies in the US, which is represented through the Interagency Network for Education and Emergencies, INEE. And although many of us interface with this network through their events, through use of their guidelines and standards and other resources, this event is an opportunity for us working in education emergencies to share our knowledge and build our networks here. Um, which is why we haven't structured this event to be like a typical, typical conference. We really wanted to promote participation and dialogue amongst everyone today. So we're having thematic workshops um, that aim to be more interactive than your typical PowerPoint presentation. And the thematic workshops will focus on three salient themes in education and emergencies. Um, one of them is on political economy, which is led by my UCBIAT executive committee um, colleague, Mario Novelli. Another a workshop is on gender and inclusion, which will be led by myself. And the third is on forced displacement, which is led by another UCBIAT um, colleague, Ruth Naylor. There she is. Um, and each of us has developed and structured these workshops to promote fruitful dialogue and partnerships with each. So that said, I'm going to stop speaking now, and I'm going to hand over to the chair for our first <coughs> opening session that aims to set the scene for the policy and research priorities across the three themes, as well as from the perspectives of two key donors who are providing a great deal of support to education in conflict and emergency com contexts. So thank you very much, and to Jenda, over to you. Okay. Um, good morning, everyone. And uh, I'd like to welcome you to the OCFIT um, event. And I think it's a, a very exciting event that uh, OCFIT and Cambridge Education have worked really hard behind the scene to put it together. Um, and um, I'd like to welcome you to this very special keynote speakers panel. Um, and uh, as, as Sharon said, that um, these keynote speakers are going to set the scene, bringing really key debates in various uh, areas of uh, work that is um, sort of happening and expanding over the last uh, um, two decades in the field of education, conflict and emergencies. Um, so I don't have a lot of things to say as a chair, really, because you are here to listen to the keynote speakers. Um, so we got f five um, uh, speakers representing various um, themes, as I said. Um, the first uh, speaker is um, Emily Todd. Um, Emily is Education Advisor uh, for the Department for International Development. Um, and uh, Emily will be talking about DFID policy and programming. The second speaker is um, Stein du Lemelieu. Um, Stein is based in the European Union. Uh, as uh, International Aid Cooperation Officer. Um, and uh, he will be talking about EU policy and programming. Um, our third speaker is uh, uh, Mario Novelli. Uh, Mario is Professor of uh, Political Economy of Education at University of Sussex. Um, so, so he's obviously going to talk about political economy. Um, the fourth speaker is uh, um, Dana Birdie. Uh, Dana is an uh, associate professor at New York University, and Dana is also the editor of the uh, Journal of Education in Emergencies. So we're really um, 
uh, pleased to have you here all the way from New York, Dana. Um, and then uh, our fifth speaker um, is uh, Benoit uh, Duensenberg uh, from UNSCR. Um, Benoit um, is an uh, uh, um, education specialist with uh, uh, UNSCR and has worked with uh, other organizations in the, in the past, and uh, Benoit will be focusing on uh, forced displacement. So each of the speakers will have uh, 10 minutes to, to talk. Um, and we are already running a bit late, um, so I'm going to have to uh, stick to time. And Bruno has asked me to give one extra minute uh, because he's got so many questions. So we, I hope that we can honor that. Um, so shall we sp start with uh, Emily? Yeah. <coughs> Thank you. Uh, good morning, all. I work in the education policy team at DFID particularly focusing on policy in education and emergencies and protracted crisis and our work with multilaterals. Um, first of all, to say thank you for Cambridge Education for convening and for hosting um, the event today. It really is a great opportunity to bring people together. And I'm going to take a few minutes this morning to focus on DFID's policy in this critical area and then essentially take full advantage of being here to pose some of the challenges and questions that we've been grappling with and hopefully then make some headway today on how DFID can best work with its partners with you to address some of these areas in our policy and programming. Can I just check, is that clear on the mic? Can you go to you? Yeah, thank you. So I'll start with our education policy. Now, many of you may be familiar with this. It was published earlier this year. And it centers on what we can do to tackle issues at the root of the learning crisis as part of our commitments towards SDG 4 for all children. And it's also within the context of 50% of DFID funding being used now in fragile and conflict affected states. And the context of our 2017 humanitarian policy, an evolving approach to how we work across humanitarian development and conflict resolution actors and within the commitment to a new approach with a greater focus on longer-term development in protracted crises. So the first critical area of the policy I want to focus on is around our commitment to invest in good teaching to improve education quality. Now, this recognizes that teaching quality is the most important factor for children's learning in schools. And it means that we need to be looking at training, recruitment, motivation of teachers, but also at protecting children from violence in schools and working with those who are supporting teacher reform. Now we need, therefore, in crisis to get the basic resources and supports to teachers to keep schools going, and some of our programming has included more flexible approaches recently to teachers' salaries and stipends, and efforts to align those as much as possible. And at the same time, looking at how we can be better investing in the longer term around teaching quality, making sure we're getting the necessary support to teachers who are then operating in some of these most challenging contexts. The second critical area that our policy is focusing on now is around backing education system reform to help make systems more effective, accountable, and inclusive. Now, we know that often the system incentives to include the most marginalized can be weak and that the complexities around education systems are, of course, incredibly pronounced in the context in which we're talking about today. And where we're talking about the dynamics of a system that needs to look at the politics, the people, the processes, and the inputs. And our efforts and investments and in our policy need to then recognize and understand the dynamics around large numbers of displaced people and to understand where conflict may undermine formal education systems, as well as the politics and risks around exacerbating conflict and of how education itself can be used. And I know these are some of the issues that are going to be coming up in the workshops later today. And then the third critical area is still around, given the challenges within education systems, how can we then target support for the most marginalised? Now, our education policy focuses in on three groups. It talks about hard-to-reach girls, picking up on a lot of the work that we've been doing through the Girls' Education Challenge that many of you will be familiar with. It commits us doing more on children with disabilities, and we want to pick up on a lot of the work that was started at the Disability Summit earlier this year 
and then commit us to zooming in and really focusing on children whose education is disrupted by conflict and crisis. We've also committed within the part of this policy to have a real focus on tackling violence against children and on doing more around mental health and psychosocial support. And I have a colleague who will be attending the INE workshops coming up, so please do follow up with me around any of these areas. Now, we've also committed to more multi-year programming in crises and with a real focus on quality of education and to joining up better across our humanitarian and development portfolios. But making sure that as we do that, we reach the most vulnerable children and avoid undermining formal education systems. And that balance is something we're really grappling with at the moment. Now, in terms of our programming, many of you will be familiar with how DFID operates. We have an extensive bilateral portfolio led by our education advisors in country. We've started to put more and more advisors into conflict and crisis affected areas, particularly across the MENA region. We've got a large program, for example, then in uh, South Sudan, focusing on girls' education, which I know will be discussed by colleagues later on. And we've also tried to be more flexible in how we're using our funding in country. In Uganda, for example, last year, we reorientated much of our education support to direct it towards refugees and towards the host communities supporting them. We're also trying to get education higher up on the agenda in opportunities around cross-government funding. We saw this particularly in some of our education work in Syria, and that's helped us to work a bit more closely across Whitehall. And then we use our multilateral channels. So we've been really behind Education Cannot Wait, as that's been setting up and sort of bedding in over the last couple of years. And also looking at how we can continue to support and, and influence through the Global Partnership for Education and for others. Now, I have also promised colleagues of mine that I would talk a little about our research agenda. I know this is a focus later on this afternoon. Um, we're working much more closely to ensure that our research really does respond to the challenges that are coming up and that it is directly informing the policy that we're producing. And there's three research areas just to draw on. Um, many of you will know these in far greater depth, so I won't go into a lot of detail at this stage. One of the critical areas has been support for the Humanitarian Education Accelerator. And this is really aiming to develop the evidence base for how to innovate successfully in crisis. We're also involved now in a new program, maintaining effective services after natural disasters. This is an area that we know often is not given enough attention. And this work is looking at aiming to improve the well-being um, of people after natural disasters and developed an improved evidence base on how multiple sectors, so looking across education, health, nutrition, water, can then work together. The third is looking at building the evidence on forced protracted displacement, focusing on those who are forcibly displaced and on their host populations by expanding the global knowledge base. And then finally, we are looking to do more specifically on education research and protracted crises, but as many of you know, this is still in development. <coughs> now, as promised, there are several areas that we are grappling with at the moment. So I want to take the last couple of minutes just to share these and then come back to them later on in the day. And these are by no means comprehensive. The critical area is... How do we increase the focus on quality of education through our support in such complex contexts? And how do we measure this? We know that it's possible to get data on learning outcomes in the most challenging environments, that it's, it's incredibly difficult, and that the data we have may not be perfect. But we've seen this being started in areas. We've seen it through our programming in Syria, the challenges around it, but also the efforts towards it. Now, as DFID, we've committed to this across all that we fund. So my key question is then, how can we best work with our partners to keep that focus on learning within our education support in conflict and in protracted crisis? Part of this is how can we better then embed mental health and psychosocial support in our education programming, where different sectors are involved and where the definitions can be incredibly broad. Does that mean we need to narrow it down in terms of how we're talking about it within education programming? And how can we ensure it's of really strong quality to meet the particular needs of children who have gone through these traumatic experiences and continue to do so? <laughs> 
And then the last area is, given the complexity of these contexts, how do we find that right balance? How do we find that right balance in responding to immediate needs with that longer-term investment for building resilient education systems? What does that mean for how we and all of us here operate in countries and for how, as DFID, we can engage with the wider international education architecture for education and emergencies and use our influence for the greatest benefit in this area? How do we ensure that through that we're reaching the most vulnerable? And then what does that mean for how we target children the kind of data that we need and how we're using that data. So these are just a few of the issues that we are grappling with, and many of you are at the moment. Um, I'm really looking forward to meeting you throughout the course of the day. Some of you in here I know, several I don't. So looking forward to the conversations today and then as we take these forwards. Thank you very much. Good morning. Um, my name is uh, Steen de Lamjure. Um, I work at the European Commission, um, which is a, a, a entity of the European Union. Um, basically, you could say that it's the implementing entity of the European Union's uh, programs and funds. Um, I, I work in the development department um, within the education team. Um, and before I start talking about what we do in terms of education and emergencies and protracted crisis, I thought of spending one or two minutes um, explaining you who is doing what within the myriads of EU institutions when, when it comes to um, uh, specifically education emergencies and protracted crisis. So the department where I work is a development one. Um, that's a, 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 we have a large uh, a portfolio. Um, on education, um, um, the biggest share goes through bilateral funding. We have um, over 40 countries where education is a priority um, for the EU. Um, Asia, Sub-Saharan Africa, Middle East, Northern Africa, Latin America, Central America. Um, it's interesting to say that uh, over half of these countries are in one or another way crisis or conflict affected. So um, this, this uh, our our programs are represent 60% of our bilateral funding. The total of the bilateral funding um, for the current budget cycle, which runs from 2014 till, till 2020, is about 3.5 billion euros. So it's, it's large. Um, we, we, of course, we have a humanitarian department as well. Um, ECHO, that might ring a bell with some of you. Um, um, our humanitarian colleagues have been working hard to get uh, education in emergencies high up on the agenda. Um, and I think we succeeded, um, evidenced by the fact that the commissioner, the current commissioner, uh, Stylianidis, um, wants and has made uh, education emergency his, his legacy. Um, this has been reflected in the new um, communication that we launched um, in May this year. I will speak about that later. But I think important there to mention is that I think it's not even five or six years ago, um, there was virtually no EU humanitarian um, funding that um, would go directly to education emergencies. It was financed through child protection initiatives. Um, that has changed. Um, I think currently we're in 2019, we're at 8% of the humanitarian funding, of the EU's humanitarian funding that goes directly to education projects, interventions and it will go up to 10% next year. So that, I think, is a major breakthrough when it comes to uh, um, giving importance to education emergencies. <coughs> I have also to mention another department, so it's, uh, we are number three. Um, it's called NEAR. Uh, this is a department that focuses on the neighborhood region of the EU. Um, because it's such an important region, there is a specific department focusing on, on that region as well. So that's, broadly speaking, Northern Africa, and the Middle East, um, very important to mention because, of course, this includes Syria and all the crisis, um, um, all the countries affected by the Syria crisis. So there is a huge portfolio there on, on, on education in emergencies, education in protracted crisis as well, managed by my colleagues from, um, um, from that particular department. There is a fourth one, which is called the European External Action Service. This, you could compare it to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. 
important to mention as well because they focus on political actions um, and it includes things like peace building um, and it has a, 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 a some initiatives some funding as well for peace building conflict resolution through education so you can already see by, by me mentioning these four actors that for us it's a challenge to all work together uh, on something that um, Emily mentioned, uh, which we call the nexus in, in EU lingo. This is bridging the humanitarian development gap. So how to bring together all these funding streams to, 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 yeah, to finance uh, efficiently intervention when, uh, intervention when it comes to education, emergencies and protected crisis. Bilateral support is our biggest channel of funding, but we also uh, have a lot of funding going to education through the multilateral uh, support, mentioned already by Emily, the Global Partnership for Education is the first one, of course. Uh, they increasingly focus also on, on countries affected by crisis. I think it's interesting always to mention that uh, I think there's a very high number of refugees that, that live in countries where the, G where the Global Partnership for Education is active. Education cannot wait as another one. We're currently looking also to the International Financing Facility for Education less relevant for crisis we understand so far. However, it could have potential as well. So many initiatives around there, um, both at bilateral level and multilateral um, level, um, which uh, is also a challenge for us uh, and something that I would like to see maybe coming up in the discussions today um, is the issue of complementarity. So um, with a myriad of actors, organizations working on, on a topic of education emergency, having said that, it's never enough. <laughs> There's huge needs there, of course, but sometimes it's very challenging for a donor to, to, to understand where to put the funding, which is limited, of course, although I, I mentioned it's large figures, but uh, if you look at the coverage over 40 countries, um, it's, it's, it's limited over a period of seven years. Um, so I've mentioned that we've launched a new a policy on education and emergencies and protected crisis. I'm going to speak a little bit about that. I think this is groundbreaking because um, our... Um, latest policy on education dates back from 2010-11. So it has, of course, been updated through other uh, uh, um, working papers. Um, but a, a policy as such um, on education in emergencies and protected crisis has not existed before at the EU level. So um, this is a major breakthrough. Um, it was launched, adopted uh, in May this year. It has huge support of the member states, of the EU member states for the moment still including the UK. Um, they um, uh, will uh, endorse the communication through something called Council Conclusions in November this year. This is important because it means that the EU member states uh, support the communication and what's in the communication. Um, main points um, within that communication, and it's available online um, if you're interested afterwards, I can share the link of course. So it sets out the EU's understanding of um, what is education emergencies and protected crisis. So our understanding is rooted in a comprehensive approach to promoting safe, inclusive, and quality learning opportunities for all. Education is understood within, within that policy as lifelong learning, including formal and non-formal delivery of early childhood, primary, secondary, and post-secondary education. So the full scale of education levels, including vocational education and training. Um, it, it deals with all types of crisis. This is important, I think, to mention, both short-term and protected crisis, so including forced displacement, um, IDPs and refugees. Um, forced displacement is, is a very important um, um, element uh, within the EU's policies. Uh, it's linked also to another policy that is specifically on forced displacement as well. Um, I mentioned both short-term and protected crisis because the nexus is a central element within the communication. And the challenges around that, mentioned already by you, on, on, on how to bring together these humanitarian aid streams, development streams, um, is, is, is a challenge, not only for our own way of working, but also externally on, on how organizations, NGOs, uh, UN agencies um, design programs actually that, that include that nexus approach, so a very important element. We, of course, recognize the scale of the need and the limitations of also, uh, also of the EU support. So we, we, uh, the communication uh, suggests to focus in particular on out-of-school children and young people and also those at risk of education disruption, um, forcibly displaced children and young people, but also the host communities. So inclusion is another essential element of the communication, inclusion of refugees in national education systems, for example. 
Um, other vulnerable and disadvantaged groups, um, separated children, unaccompanied children, uh, children and young people living in hard to reach areas, disability, uh, children associated with armed forces and groups, ethno linguistic minorities, poor socio economic groups. Um, I've been said I've only got two minutes, so I have to be, I have to choose what I'm going to mention further. Um, it has four strategic priorities. So, so one is on system strengthening. Partnership building for rapid, efficient, effective, and innovative education response. So there comes the nexus in as well. Um, we also have very high on the agenda support to quality education for better learning uh, outcomes and the challenges that comes with that. How do you measure quality? What do you put in place uh, to make sure that children learn when affected by crisis? Um, and uh, promoting education for peace building and conflict prevention. So conflict sensitive education, peace building, child protection, uh, psychosocial support, uh, et cetera, et cetera, are very important within, within that policy. Um, we, ha we also have a number of specific commitments in there. Um, an important one, for example, is that the policy commits the EU to proactive and re rapid response mechanisms to reach and aim to return children and young people to learning uh, within three months when affected by crisis. So this is in line with the commitment that the EU has to the CRRF, the Comprehensive Refugee Response Framework. Um, System strengthening, I have already mentioned that this is important because through our bilateral cooperation, we, we, we prioritize system strengthening, uh, how to make systems more resilient uh, to crisis or to the impact of crisis. This also includes a, a very important component of emergency preparedness, so how to be prepared for when emergencies uh, uh, strike, crisis strike. Another specific commitment is support to certification, accreditation, recognition and transition of displaced children and young people between education systems, very high on the policy agenda. A number of specific commitments on child protection um, and capacity building as another one of education actors, which goes from state uh, actors, uh, CSOs, um, so how to build the capacity of the coordination structures that are set up to address education needs in, in, in crisis, things like the education cluster, for example. Evidence building and research is the last specific commitment I'm going to mention because this is important also for today's agenda. So um, there is a commitment there to, to, to invest in evidence building research, better quality um, evidence. Uh, some of the challenges to, to finish with that, that we see um, and that I would be interested in seeing what it is that's being discussed today during the workshops as well. The first one is the nexus that I've already mentioned. So in, in what you will be discussing this afternoon, what we will be discussing this afternoon, thinking about the nexus, humanitarian and development. Um, innovative financing is another one that, that is, is getting higher and higher on the agenda, not only for education, but it will come for our uh, financing. Uh, uh, it's, it's being looked as well um, at in initiatives like IFIT, the International Financing Facility for Education. So innovative financing for education. Regional initiatives is another one. So cross-border, regional crisis, how do you address that? So that's a, a last challenge that I wanted to mention that I would hope that um, uh, comes out in the discussions of this afternoon as well. So I'm very, mu uh, very much looking forward to uh, um, discussing all these issues with you during the run of the day. Thanks again. Thank you. <clears throat> if you don't mind. Um, uh, thanks very much. Uh, really excited about today's uh, event. And um, my task is to introduce a little um, about the issue of uh, political economy, uh, which will be a theme that runs across. And um, I'm drawing today on research that I did, a liter critical literature review of the political economy of education in conflict-affected states that was published in 2014 published by DFID, uh, and I've got quite comprehensive PowerPoint that I'll share with everyone after, and there's a range of links. So in a sense, I'm going to give you a guided tour of the PowerPoint, but I won't have time to go through everything. Um, so I think what I wanted to begin with is to just say a couple of words about why political economy has become much more interesting and important, not only for academic researchers, but also for practitioners, policymakers over the last 15, 20 years. 
Um, we saw signs of that really since 2000 from EU, USAID, World Bank, DFID, who developed a range of political economy toolkits because they recognised that um, projects and programmes were failing, not because of the technical beauty of the education programmes that they were funding, but actually um, because of the conditions under which those policies were implemented in. There were issues of politics and economics uh, that were intervening in those projects. And so there was a recognition on their part um, that more research needed to be understood in what often would be a, a called in more narrow research externalities that are actually bracketed away in much educational research. So political economy starts to try uh, to do that. Now, having said that, there are a range of political economy uh, approaches from neoclassical uh, or neoclassical uh, economics-inspired approaches to broader critical cultural political economy. Um, but I think that what unites them uh, is an interest in the way political and economic interests and preferences intervene, shape, effect, policy, uh, and programming. Um, and I think that uh, one of the things that we should say is that I think that political economy analysis can be enormously important for policy and practitioners, but also for critical academic research. Uh, and I think that you know, our role as academics is not just to serve policy, but also to critique it and to challenge it. And I think that political economy is a good uh, approach to be able to do that. Um, I draw a lot on the work of uh, Roger Dale, uh, who talks about the difference between education politics, that being issues internal, the politics internal to education systems, and what he talks about the politics of education, which tries to understand education problems and systems as embedded within a complex local, national, and global political economy, with the argument being that you can't bracket off education from the broader social milieu within which it exists. Um, so then the question is, so what can this political economy approaches bring to practitioners, policymakers, and researchers? And our argument in the political economy literature review that I referenced earlier was that actually it could help in a range of the classic domains of, of the policy cycle. It can help with understanding what are the drivers that set the agendas that then often we have to manage on the ground. Uh, what are the political economy factors in processes of policy formulation? And what are those political economy factors in policy implementation? So the whole cycle of policy, political economy, can uh, be helpful to understand some of the issues. Um, and I think that uh, um, what political economy, I think, can do, particularly in the domain of kind of understanding agenda settings, is to start to locate some of the discourses of the EU, DFID, for example, within the broader and sweeping transformations that have taken place in the world in the last 20 years. Um, and what I would say is that both the EU and DFID's agendas are shaped by the intervention of geopolitics and geoeconomics into the aid agenda. Um, what I would say is that during the Cold War, there is massive critiques of the way aid was used uh, for Cold War politics and diverted from humanitarian concerns. And after the end of the Cold War, there was an aspiration that people would come together. There was Paris agreements, donor coordination. 9-11 ended that. Since then, everybody's priority has been security and the amounts of money that have been transferred of aid towards the security agenda have been huge. And we've seen that with DFID, 50% of aid to education goes to conflict-affected states, uh, I think reflects that more generally in the aid community. Since 2008 and the global financial crisis, Western governments have come in increased pressure to justify giving aid outside to other countries, and for that reason, they're starting to raise more and more questions of what is in it for us? Uh, how can aid work for the British economy and our interests? And I think that we need to scrutinize those factors uh, when we try to understand education policy and how it manifests itself. Um, 
The classic example is the uneven geography of development assistance. It is not directly related to humanitarian need. It is much more uh, related to geopolitical concerns. There are worthy and unworthy victims in these world. And uh, the unworthy victims, though they need, they don't often get resources. So OECD's report recognizes that 74% of ODA spent in fragile context was concentrated on only 20 of the 58 fragile uh, contexts. Uh, so uh, you can read more detail about that, but there is disproportionate resources allocated to certain countries at certain moments, and also a very swift shifting of priorities. Um, you saw recently the visit of Theresa May uh, around Africa. Uh, there was a clear and direct emphasis in her talk that international development assistance aims at not only combating extreme poverty, but supporting our own national interest. Uh, it needs to be aligned with our own national security interests. So what does that mean? Well, it means that Boris Johnson last year went to Myanmar and attempted to negotiate giving uh, powdered milk to uh, young children in return for reduction in tariffs in whiskey. That is what's happening now. Uh, aid is being used as a mechanism through which to produce new trade deals. So these are the kind of things that, in a sense, shape the agenda upon which we understand whether education, where and whether education is important to our country. So I think that uh, political economy at that level can start to help us raise some of those uh, issues. Similarly, the question of uh, refugees, uh, this is an advert from the Australian government, but reflective of a rising xenophobia and nationalism towards refugees, which can help explain why it is that so many Western nations are focusing their aid budgets on making sure refugees remain in Turkey and other areas and not enter the European Union. So there are a range of issues there about the morality of Western nations in their allocation of development resources. Um, at the national level that we'll talk to, um, we've also worked quite a lot on issues of conflict sensitivity and trying to bring a lens that asks not only uh, whether education programs are supporting quality learning outcomes, but whether education systems are contributing or undermining the conditions under which sustainable peace can be achieved. And drawing on issues around redistribution, reconciliation, recognition, um, and representation, We've developed tools, my colleagues uh, from the University of Ulster, from UCL, to analyze education systems in terms of those kind of uh, conflict drivers and issues around the balance between uh, reconciliation and the need to address some of those underlying things and how the education uh, system uh, contributes to those. And uh, although sometimes academics get accused of being abstract. Um, much of this work was applied through UNICEF peace building education program. Uh, the conflict sensitive <laughs> analysis was deployed in 15 different countries. It will also be in the next uh, education sector handbook to help national policy planners uh, analyze their education systems. So there is real practical utility in some of these questions, albeit that sometimes the political economy analysis gives poli policymakers some unpalatable home truths, which make their job difficult because, of course, it's not Emily who is setting that agenda. Emily has to manage that agenda. But there is a very heavy political agenda that sits on all of us. And sometimes it's the elephant in the room that never gets discussed. And I think that we need to discuss that much more. So just to conclude, um, in the next two workshops that we'll be running, the first one uh, um, with Tajendra Farali and Kelsey Shanks will look at their work in Nepal and northern Iraq and try to understand the political economy factors at the national level that influence education policy making and Afghanistan. Uh, and uh, the second session 
we'll focus a little more on the tools and the practicality of carrying uh, those uh, research. So we welcome everybody to engage in that debate, and I'm happy to share the PowerPoint and uh, other uh, literature afterwards. Thank you very much. I'm going to stand because, um, because I didn't bring a hard copy of my PowerPoint, so it'll be a little bit easier for me to see it if I stand. I just want to note that that poster that Mario just presented from the Australian government, it is a real thing. I saw it. As many of you know, I work a lot in Afghanistan and Pakistan, and when I was going through the departure lounge and actually leaving the airport in Pakistan, I was greeted by this massive poster, no way, you will not make our country home. I was shocked, as you can imagine. It's quite, um, quite striking when you see it when you're leaving a country. Um, you can imagine seeing that in, in New York, that would be a little bit odd, but um, maybe it would have a very different kind of reaction from New Yorkers who were leaving their country on their way to wherever. Um, so, what I'm here to talk about today, first of all, I'd like to thank the organizers for making today such an interesting event and such a wonderful plan. I'm looking forward to the conversations this afternoon. Thank you so much to Sharon Tao and Ruth Naylor and Mario Novelli for inviting me and organizing this wonderful day. And thank you to Cambridge Education for hosting us all here. And UCFIAT as an organization, thank you so much to making this happen on your off year for conferences. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, I have a little bit of a cold, so um, I might need to reach for my water in a minute. So I'm, I'm going to talk about uh, gender and inclusion in crises, in education and crises. And um, what I think is very important is that, in fact, when we think about what we know, and when I say what we know, I'll also be referring to my um, rigorous literature review that was funded by DFID and INEE from 2015, what we know in the standards of rigorous either experimental research or observational research, what we know about these questions related to gender and inclusion is really not very much. I'll tell you a little bit about our findings from that time and update that somewhat for today. So just a note about methods for that literature review. We, my team of graduate students and I, we culled through thousands and thousands of articles to look for the, the um, the, the needle in the haystack, those articles that were specifically about the questions that we were most interested in understanding better education and emergencies questions. And we culled that, um, those thousands of, of um, hits from the databases down to about 251 pieces. And then we included a total of 184 articles in that review for DFID in INE in 2015. That is available on their website. Um, I don't believe I have a link to it here, but I can circulate that afterwards for people who are interested. Um, <clears throat> so selected findings on girls, specifically girls and education. We noted that the research, what the research tells us to date is, for example, that community-based education certainly eliminates distance and other issues that affect girls particularly badly. Boys also in countries affected by conflict, but girls even more so at especially higher ages and providing close access to education. In other words, a school in a village in Afghanistan, for example, where some of this research comes from. As you may know, some of my research focuses on this. Um, this actually eliminates gender disparity in access between boys and girls, which is a remarkable finding from the research, and significantly reduces the achievement gap. Does not eliminate it, so I'll talk about that in just a minute, but certainly reduces it. We also found that providing female teachers, girls-only schools, accelerated learning programs, particularly for over-age girls who are often out of school of course, during conflict, uh, boys as well, but girls are particularly affected in 
um, have often struggled to get back into the education system for reasons that are different from the way the reasons boys struggle to get back into the education system. Girls will often be married early and then give up education after that. Boys will often go to work and give up education after that. And sometimes each do both. We don't know a lot about the numbers because we really don't have a lot of data on it. But we have um, observational studies that show some of these outcomes. We also have um, observational studies that show approaches to distance learning for primary, overage, and secondary school students that show promise, but we don't have a lot of evidence, as I said. In countries or regions affected by disasters, there is virtually no evidence on girls and students with disabilities, children with disabilities, how to create um, programs that are more resilient in disaster-affected contexts. These are really, really important questions, and they're particularly urgent because the numbers of people who are affected by disasters in the world are far greater, actually, than the numbers of people who are affected by conflict, and we know the conflict numbers are large. That is only, the numbers affected by disasters, those numbers are only going to grow over time as climate change um, increases and becomes more dramatic. In, um, on questions related to girls' well-being, we know that there are a number of these programs show promise. Again, we have very limited evidence that is rigorous in the way we, we were asked to define it in this review. We know that creative arts and play therapies show promise. Early childhood development, there is some very good data on that, and there's some emerging data or current studies underway. A number of you probably know about the study that my colleague at NYU is working on with Sesame Street. My colleague Hiro Yoshikawa and Alice and uh, Alice Wormley are working with Sesame Street and IRC to look at early childhood education questions among Syrian refugees in five countries in the Middle East. And that will show terrific data, I think, on, on these ECD questions that are very important to us. Um, also, provision of extra services to the most vulnerable, extra supplemental services seem to have promise, but which services exactly, how do they work under, under which circumstances? We don't have a lot of concrete information. Um, as I mentioned, virtually no studies, we returned no studies from our search on disabilities. Given the fact that we can assume, logically assume that disabilities are likely to affect children living in conflict-affected countries, more than in um, societies that are not affected by conflict, this is a huge oversight, to say the least, not to have included, um, not to have examined the question about the way in which crisis affects education for children with disabilities. In critical issue to examine further. I want to commend DFID and um, the Secretary of Development here for. Um, we're really igniting a, a new wave of interest in disabilities. Um, Penny Mordant, I hope I'm saying her name correctly, thank you, um, has launched, an, as many of you know in the room, has launched a new initiative and has, uh, has committed DFID to look at issues related to disabilities across all of DFID programs. I wish we would do the same in my country. I think that's unlikely to happen anytime soon. But um, hopefully, hopefully things will start to change a bit in the coming fall. <laughs> um, not to allude to any biases, but um, you might be able to guess what my bias would be on that question. Um, cutting edge changes may also be around the corner with a stiffed commitment, so I'm looking forward to learning more about those, uh, those policies and practices. Refugees, there is strong emerging evidence and there are many studies underway. There is a burgeoning cottage industry of research on education related to refugees, but those studies are currently in process. You may know, many of you in the room may know, that we at the Journal on Education and Emergencies are featuring a special issue on refugees and education in our next issue, our upcoming issue. And the deadline for that is around the corner, the deadline for article submissions is around the corner. I'll talk more about the journal this afternoon and I'll discuss that, that particular special issue in a little bit more detail, but please don't hesitate to let me or Ruth, who's another board member of the Journal on Education Emergencies, don't hesitate to let us know if you have questions about it.
So what are some of the critical gaps? I have two minutes left to discuss these very important questions and some more emerging, emerging research. What works for boys, of course, does not always work for girls. We need to understand this much better. We do have some preliminary evidence that seems to suggest that post-traumatic stress, um, which is actually a hotly debated topic in the field of socio-emotional learning, social-emotional well-being, we, we have um, some indication that psychosocial programs interact with boys and girls very differently. We need to understand exactly how differently and in which, under which conditions, which types of programs interact differently for boys and girls. We also need to understand more about, um, absolutely critically is to understand more about the ways in which education functions for girls and boys in stable countries. How does that differ in countries? How does that differ in countries affected by crisis? For example, we know that in many stable countries around the world, girls outperform boys at the primary school level. This is a this is commonly known among educational um, education scholars and people who focus on early childhood. Uh, excuse me, on on development in primary school. It is not necessarily the case. It is not the case in many conflict-affected countries. Often, boys outperform girls at the primary school level. Certainly, that's what my data show in Afghanistan and in Pakistan. So one emerging area of research that is critical for us to reflect on and understand better, and I've seen almost, almost no data on this except for our own, and I have a link here to our most recent research brief on education administration and women's representation. How does the presence of women in educational administration affect outcomes for girls? And how does the presence of people with disabilities in educational administration affect outcomes for people with disabilities living in countries affected by conflict? We know that in countries without conflict, th this kind of representation is critical. We see that in Afghanistan, for example, according to my research, women are vastly underrepresented at, up, at the upper echelons of education administration. That doesn't mean they're not well represented among teachers. They are. But we're not talking about teachers making, teachers often are not the decision making uh, members of uh, education policy communities. These teachers, um, the, the, excuse me, the education administrators that we interviewed in Afghanistan, this is qualitative data, let me point that out. But these administrators, they pointed out that there were challenges in hiring practices, in lack of professional job support for women. Norms and expectations differed for women than for men. And they also talked about the problems associated with distance and community for women in Afghanistan who are working for the Ministry of Education. Thank you so much. I look forward to our conversation this afternoon. And I look forward to hearing more about all the research that all of you are engaged in. Thank you. Thank you, Chief Jenga. Good morning. My name is Benoit Dansenbol. I recently joined the uh, education team of UNHCR in uh, Copenhagen. It's always a challenge to be the last panelist on a panel but I will try to keep you uh, fully awake during this presentation. And I wanted to thank the UCFIET uh, organizers for inviting us. Um, first of all, I will start with some statistics. Uh, I'm sure that many of you are familiar with those uh, numbers. But uh, around the world, we have 68.5 million forcibly displaced worldwide. 25.4 uh, out of those are refugees, either under UNHCR or UNRWA's mandate. 40 million are internally displaced because of conflict. Uh, if you add the 18.8 .8 million uh, of uh, people who are displaced because of natural <coughs> hazard uh, emergencies. Those come on top of the, the 40 million. We have 3.1 million asylum seekers. And this last statistics is uh, very important. 13.4, two thirds 
of the refugees uh, in pro protracted situations. 50% of those refugees are under the age of 18. 7.4 are uh, of uh, school age uh, refugees and 92% of school age refugees are hosted in developing countries. The, the sad and shocking news is that in 2017, despite all the efforts of partners committed to the New York Declaration and the Global Compact of Refugees, the number of refugee children out of school has increased by half a million. If you look at the situation at the various uh, education <coughs> levels, and you, if you compare the situation of non-refugees with refugee uh, children and youth, you can see that uh, we, there's still a long way to go. At the primary level, we've um, managed to improve the situation from 50% in 2015 to 61% last year, 2017. But I think what is kind of striking is the situation at the secondary uh, level, where we still have a very mere 23% of refugee children and youth accessing secondary education. And at the higher education level, you can see that the situation is really bad with only 1% refugees accessing higher education. This is the last slide on, on statistics, I promise. Um, here, I think it's in interesting to see in this first chart that very few children who have access to primary uh, education can make it to secondary education. And if you combine primary education with lower uh, secondary, refugees' children are five times more likely to be out of school. Okay, so what is the, the solution to address this this? Uh, this uh, very difficult situation. Um, the uh, UNHCR strategy has been since 2012 to include and uh, encourage ministries of education to include refugees into their sector plans, into national schools. And uh, this is, we see here a, a list of the the reasons and advantages of having such an inclusion policy. One of them is obviously to ensure quality certified education, which has been a, a real challenge when uh, we, in the past, we had parallel education systems put in place in refugee situations. Um, this, will, this inclusion of uh, refugee children into national schools will require the, um, the involvement and engagement of a number of partners. You see those partners here. Um, I think this is very much aligned with the global compact on refugees that uh, perhaps we should be uh, discussing later today. Uh, here I will go very fast. Um, this, um, at the primary level, thanks to the, uh, the support of Educate a Child, the enrollment has, we've managed to increase the in enrollment since 2015 by one million, uh, but much more remains to, to be done. Uh, as I said, the situation of youth uh, and the, the, the post-primary education level requires additional uh, support. And uh, this is the reason why we have launched a youth education program, initially in four countries with the uh, idea and the plan to move on to 
more countries in the, in the future. Accelerated education is obviously a very important component of the response. Uh, I think for those of us who've worked in, uh, in uh, refugee situations, this frustration and of, of children who cannot access uh, secondary education is something that is tangible. When you discuss with youths, uh, you can see their frustration, you can understand the lack of hope uh, so it is very important for those children who either never went uh, to school or dropped out to have access to this accelerated education initiative. Tertiary education, as I said, uh, very, uh, a very uh, uh, low level of, of access with only 1%. And over the years, through the DAFI scholarship program and also connected learning, um, we've, we've managed to enroll 14,000 uh, refugee students. Um, but uh, this is something that's clearly an area that requires uh, more support. Connected learning is, uh, the, the idea is to work with universities and try to, um, to bring uh, access to education at the higher education level to students through connectivity. Innovation, um, we, we are working with a number of partners into bringing the um, uh, bringing quality education to students and teachers uh, through, again, connectivity. Okay, I was asked, and that's why I asked for one more minute, but that will be very brief. The, in the concept note, there were two questions. One is, which curriculum should be used? And I, as I've said, I think you understand, the, the UNHCR policy in its uh, strategy is clearly to try to integrate refugees into national systems from sector plan to schools. Um, so uh, I think in the past, in many contexts, we set up parallel systems using the home country uh, curriculum. We've seen the limitations of that. Um, and I think even if there is a lot of resistance, initial resistance from parents to uh, shift, you know, uh, to, to, this, to the um, host country curriculum, this has proved to be much more, uh, bringing much more quality and also access to certification, which is very important. Then on teachers, again, um, I think the, uh, the idea is to try to work with ministries of education, build capacities, uh, ensuring that ministries of education are able to provide and, and fund uh, teachers. Uh, so this is the work we do at the sector plan level. Uh, this point is directly related to the point that was uh, raised earlier about how to connect humanitarian uh, to bridge the divide and, and enhance the nexus. So a point that we should be discussing further later on. Thank you. Um, thanks very much for all the panelists. Uh, it was really stimulating. And uh, um, if you remember, we were given some uh, extra 20 minutes for tea and coffee at the beginning. I'm very tempted to, uh, to, to steal some of the time from, from coffee so that we have an opportunity to, um, to, to listen to a few comments and questions and, and also probably one minute each uh, at the end to respond uh, from the, from the panellists. Um, I think we've uh, heard a wide range of uh, issues and, uh, and uh, exciting uh, work that is happening in the, um, in the field. Uh, and um, Emily um, started with the, with the uh, sort of uh, messes that uh, 
um, donor community is um, really putting uh, a priority on uh, education in, and in conflict and increasingly more and more funding is being provided. Um, clearly from the EU's point of view as well, um, education in uh, conflict and emergencies is, is, is a priority. But I think what we also heard from Mario is that how these priorities are decided and which countries receive uh, uh, you know, funding and for what purposes and what are the hidden sort of agendas um, around that. Um, from Dana, we heard that um, uh, girls uh, and boys uh, are affected differently in conflict-affected contexts, and then we need to apply a more sort of a gender perspective in order to support uh, girls and, of course, the um, children with disabilities. And I think, finally, um, uh, Benoit presented a, a quite a sort of challenging picture of the um, difficulties that uh, uh, children in refugee contexts are, are experiencing. And, and most importantly, that uh, less than 1% um, uh, graduates actually go to universities in refugee context is quite, um, quite devastating. And I think this is increasing uh, because of the fact that uh, children, young people from uh, middle-income countries where educational access and university education um, has historically been um, quite good, and when the crisis comes to those sort of places, then the world uh, humanitarian sector experiences new kind of challenges, which uh, historically it has not been really sort of well equipped to do, to deal with. Um, and we have papers around um, uh, the issues of uh, refugee context and, and of course higher education later on during the workshop. So, um, so I, I'd like to open the floor for a few comments and questions. Um, maybe so take about four questions or comments to, to um, start uh, and then leave the rest for the workshops or during the coffee break to catch up with the panelists. Uh, we've got uh, the microphone over there. Please uh, just uh, raise your hand. And Hello, um, Wena Price, Global Partnership for Education. Um, so this morning we've heard kind of several um, different priorities from each organisation and researcher on what you'd like to see moving forward. I was wondering if each of you could pick one of those priorities and say which you feel is the most important that you'd like to um, uh, see developed today. Thank you. Anyone else? I'm sure there are some comments and questions. I can see colleagues who are very experienced in the in the field. Yeah, <laughs> Stephanie. Hi, it's Stephanie Bengtson. Um, thanks very much for these engaging, this engaging way to start the morning. Um, I think my question is more, uh, I, I suppose it sort of connects with what Dana's been talking about, uh, but sort of more broadly that when we take an approach to vulnerability, uh, we tend to think in these discrete categories. So we talk about girls education, we talk about disabilities, we talk about children affected by conflict. And I'm wondering, um, if you maybe see some productive spaces opening up to think about intersectionality, to think about how those um, different vulnerabilities might overlap um, and what that might look like uh, for research projects and programming moving forward. Okay, one more. Just to maybe a question, mostly for UNHCR, it's Elisa Malis from the Open University, mostly for UNHCR, but also to other panelists. Uh, are there any cross-border or any inter-country initiatives uh, or, or visions uh, to acknowledge, uh, accredit uh, the learning and the skills uh, of teachers and educators in informal uh, settings? Okay, um, one last question, Elaine. Uh, thanks to Ginger, it's uh, Elaine Antalta from uh, UCL. 
I guess it would be very interesting to hear the reflections on Mario's provocation from uh, DFID and uh, the European Commission and uh, UNHCR. I mean, I appreciate that uh, the point he made that uh, you are implementing and protecting space that is um, under threat, but how do you see the, 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 the threats around nationalism and austerity and so on in relation to your work? Okay, so I'll add one more question and then give uh, the floor to the panelists. Um, um, so given the uh, issues that we discussed and opportunities that we, we heard and uh, also the, the, the reference that Dana made uh, around the, the challenging um, sort of uh, political environment globally that we live in and also uh, Britain uh, at the verge of, uh, um, I don't know what it is trying to do. Um, how, how do you see the, the, the field that has emerged as a quite a substantial uh, sort of theory, practice, research, and po policy that, uh, uh, which is the testimony of the, the uh, colleagues here who are interested in this field. Ha w what kind of challenges do you see um, as moving forward in 2019? Yeah. Hi, thank you. Um, that still, yeah. Yeah. Okay, a few things to comment on and several of what as well to reflect on, I think, over the course of the day. So I don't know, Elaine, if I can fully answer your question now, but I'll have a, I'll have a first go at it. Um, in terms of the biggest priority, uh, which is the first question, I think, that was asked, ours is really about this, how do we increase the focus on quality of education through our support? So if we're talking about humanitarian and development programming at DFID, and we don't have a clear distinction in our funding, as some other donors do, um, how do we look more at what effective development programming and high quality programming looks like in those contexts? And for education, what does that mean in terms of focusing on what children are learning? So that's the kind of primary area. And I think, I was jumping to your question, Stendra, that that's the challenge that we want to really focus on in 2019. And where is it? You know, we're still really struggling with this. So what are the conversations that we still need to be having with our partners? Where are we missing things? What are the other challenges that we're not focusing on enough so that we can do this better? Yes, on the question on, on um, uh, mentioning one, one priority, I, I think for us, um, and I've said it in my, um, in my presentation, um, the, the nexus uh, is, is, is very important. And, and I think it's very closely linked to what UNHCR mentions on, on inclusion. So um, starting from the immediate emergency response to a crisis, an ongoing uh, crisis, starting to think already about uh, linking actions to existing education systems, um, how that works, what needs to be done for that, what needs to be prioritized for that. So. It's, it's strongly linked to the theme of inclusion. Um, but I think one, one additional element there that I want to mention is that we often talk, uh, when we speak about inclusion, we, are, we often refer to refugees. But IDPs are as important, I think. And in the 40 plus countries uh, that I've mentioned uh, where we have our bilateral cooperation, there's a huge number of IDPs also. And we, we're, we're very aware of that. So inclusion for us is also about IDPs. Um, so that's on the, on the one priority question. Uh, the political economy, very important. Uh, when listening to your presentation, Mario, I, I sort of see two, two things there. I mean, one, one thing is a bigger question, you know, the big picture thing, where, where does aid go? Yeah, and it has to fit within the interest of, of, of what is being decided at the political level. For the EU, we shouldn't forget that these are the EU member states. So uh, this is not really, I mean, this is driven by interest of the EU member states. It goes to the European Parliament, the European Council, and so on and so forth. So absolutely a, a very strong political interest there. The other one, I think, which is um, very important as well when it comes to education programming is a political um, uh, economy analysis at national level of the countries where we have our education programs. Uh, I'm going on a mission to Sudan on, on Friday, uh, just to give you an example. Uh, in Sudan, the EU is not allowed, and I think a number of other donors either, to channel funds through the authorities, through, through the government. However, you, 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 we, we want to operate there. 
Um, so we're going there for a specific scoping mission on refugee education for mainly South Sudanese refugees, but not only. So the challenge there to operate and to analyze what are the different factors that play, play a role in there, not allowed to work through the government, but yet you have to work with the government, otherwise you cannot operate, is, is very, very challenging. Um, one thing I think which, which, which we need to mention also is that, yes, there is a political agenda, of course. Uh, I would be the last one to uh, deny that. Um, however, I think there's space to work more through multilateral mechanisms as well. Where you, for example, when we finance the Global Partnership for Education, our contribution, the EU's contribution, which is quite substantive, is not ring-fenced. Uh, our contribution to education cannot wait is not ring-fenced. So there you have the opportunity actually to, to use funding, public funding available for education to channel through multilateral mechanisms, which eventually would end up in countries that might otherwise not make it to the political agenda of donor X, Y, and Z. This is just something that, that, you know, there is a political agenda, but it's also ways of working with a political agenda. And the last point, education is very high on the agenda. There's a very good political momentum for education. So I think we need to keep on uh, uh, grabbing that opportunity uh, for the coming years, yeah. Thanks. Um, yeah, thanks for the comments. Um, I, uh, I think that I'll address some of these issues of what I think is important uh, in terms of this debate. I think that you know, my main argument is about trying to um, debunk the myth that um, our security and our development uh, and uh, conflict-affected contexts and community security and economic development are mutually always compatible. There are tensions and contradictions in that. And, you know, best practice, which is recognised, is to try to separate these things out, you know, to have your foreign policy and military strategy and to have your economic strategy and keep development focused on... This was a consensus, yeah? My position was mainstream a few years ago. You've all moved to the right, not me. Uh, and now we have the Dutch government. I spoke uh, two weeks ago at the Dutch Ministry of Foreign Affairs. They've merged their international trade and international development department. It's a clear, explicit position that Dutch aid contributes to the development of countries all around North Africa now, the focus, for the, exactly the reasons I was, I was telling, telling you before, um, and to maintain the Dutch government's economic position as the fastest growing economy in Europe. Yeah. Those things have tensions and contradictions. There are not win-win situations in these things. Um, the second thing I think that that leads me to, to make a plea for, which is a plea that, you know, it's fantastic that this field has grown so much over such a short period. But most of the money for research is driven by uh, powerful donors and agencies. And for that reason, um, the critical questions that allow you to step back are never asked. So it's always the kind of policy relevant uh, questions. So there is not much monitoring of this. You know, ask USAID, ask DFID, how much money was spent on sector reform in Iraq? and how much was wasted, yeah? How much money has been spent in Afghanistan on constructing schools that were then subsequently destroyed two days later? There is money wasted in our field precisely for these reasons that we are merging security and economy. So I think that we need more research to reveal those, to open up uh, those questions. And then just the third uh, thing, in, at the national level, most education systems are path dependent on a logic that the, that the education system contributes to the economy. And of course, the, it, that's true. But education systems also matter in war and peace. Education is always one of those issues that armed groups mention when they take an armed struggle for whatever reasons, whether it's because they don't like a Western education system or because they want broader access. But you'll find education matters holistically. So we need when we analyze education sector planning and programming, 
to take issues seriously of the drivers of conflict, to make education systems more sensitive. Now, that, that also is a consensus. The question is how to do that, how to integrate that into planning and policy processes so that we take seriously not only economic growth, but also conflict sensitivity, social cohesion, all of those matters, because that is really important uh, for, for many of these contexts. Thanks very much, and thanks, thanks for the questions. Um, really, really um, insightful and compelling, and maybe if I turn that off, that will help. Is that better? It's working. It's working, but it's just, uh, OK. Can everyone hear me OK? There's just a lot of feedback. Um, Okay, thank you. Can you hear me? Great. Um, really compelling questions. Thank you so much. And compelling prompts from all of my panelists on the up here. Um, let me just say one priority, very tough question. I feel like it's a trick question for all of us because we're not accustomed to having to identify one or maybe my colleagues in, in, um, in the bilateral organizations that fund have to focus on priorities. But as research, I feel like researchers, I feel like we often get to say, hey, you know, all of these things are really important and you guys, you policymakers, please go figure it out. But um, what I would like to say, it forced, I would say, absolutely critical to think about what we're going to do to protect communities affected by disaster and those types of crises. There's a tsunami coming and we're not prepared. It's, it's shocking to me and should be something lighting a fire under all of us in this room that, that um, these disasters that we see growing every year are getting worse and more extreme, and we need to understand what makes communities that might already be affected by conflict more resilient to these crises. What is it that's going to improve resilience in, in fragile, environmentally fragile places, and environmentally fragile places that are, in many cases, already affected by conflict? This is a critical question, priority, I would say. And of course, within that, how are girls affected differently? What, what happens to people with disabilities? All of our inclusion questions that will lead me right to Stephanie's next question, which is about intersectionality. Intersectionality is a term that has been extremely popular on US college campuses um, in the past several years and hotly debated, but I think brings us very important, um, uh, shines a light in important ways on people's multiple vulnerabilities. In research, we need to dis disaggregate those vulnerabilities. So we need to understand how people who are affected by more than one vulnerability are different perhaps from people who are affected by only one vulnerability, if we can um, separate it out in those ways. And I think we should be able to do that and think in those terms of isolating these um, challenges that people face. The next question, the next very compelling and provocative issue about nationalism in our in our own countries and how our own nationalism and um, and extreme and extremism political extremism in my country among um, people who are sometimes referred to as right wing extremists how does that affect our our domestic politics how does our that then in turn affect our aid giving one tool, very important for everyone in the room, including the, uh, our colleagues who are members, who are, who are um, part of bilateral organizations, one important fact to keep in mind is that research shows that aid given altruistically is actually more effective at winning hearts and minds that aid given unaltruistically or, or perceived as unaltruistically with utilitarian goals is. I, th I think that's very useful information, particularly for people working inside governments. It's very useful, useful information to have. There isn't a lot of research on this, but there, the research that was done was done on the aid given in the earthquake in Pakistan in 2005. And if anyone's interested in knowing more about that study, I can tell you um, Tahir and Dravi led the work in, in Pakistan. Um, and I would also say um, along those lines that um, uh, 
I think our, our colleagues also mentioned some very important points um, and, and um, that collaborations are critical, collaborations not just with these multi um, um, multinational mechanisms to provide aid, but also collaborations with all of you in the room. This is also very important for um, diffusing those challenges. I would point out that Mario's references to uh, the securitization of aid has often been incursion of military into aid roles. In Afghanistan, for example, the building of schools, and particularly those that were then destroyed, that, that was funded by the military. USAID actually gave most of its funding to community-based education, which doesn't require any new infrastructure, which is very important. Oh, I've gone on too long. So um, let, me just, let me just wrap up by saying um, thank you very much. Perfect. I will be very brief. Um, the priority is inclusion. I think you've heard the word many times. Um, it has many implications that we can discuss, but it's clearly the, uh, the priority. Um, on national interest, I don't think that as a multilateral organization we have a hidden national interest, but I think our interest is to bring all uh, refugee youth and children to school. Uh, it's clearly what we are uh, trying to do and uh, with um, aligned with the Global uh, Compact for Refugees. Uh, res which has a number of principles, responsibility sharing, re refugee self-reliance, working with communities. So we will be guided by the, um, by the agenda, by the, the compact. And then finally on the question of, of uh, recognition, um, I think a good example is what the IGAT countries are trying to do in Eastern Africa. Um, is it, do you, I would um, uh, encourage you to look at the Djibouti Declaration whereby seven countries have uh, decided to uh, try to include refugees within their national systems and that includes also teacher certification. Thank you. Okay, so thanks very much. Um, so I think it's been really uh, a great discussion and uh, I think uh, our panelists uh, deserve a round of uh, applause. Thank you very much. And I think, uh, so these ideas have definitely inspired us to explore further how we can unpack some of the problematic issues um, and also sort of try and understand the elephants in the room in sort of little safe environments in the workshops. Um, so afterwards, um, I hope that you enjoy the, the rest of the sort of um, uh, activities, particularly the workshops after this, because we've gone past a little bit further. So can we propose that we start at five minutes past 11 so that we got uh, some time for break? So thank you very much. Yeah.